Thanks for joining us today. We are always encouraged to know that God is using this ministry to touch lives all across the world through what He's doing right here in Murfreesboro, Illinois. Please take a moment and share what God is doing in your life by sending an email to info at cccmurphy.com. We trust that you will be blessed by today's message. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to uh, Genesis. We're going to be in Genesis, the first chapter. I, I want to share something with you that I think is important for us, and I think sometimes we miss. And so I'm going to be teaching today. I may get a little excited, uh, but I plan to teach some. So what I want to talk to you about is from this topic, and I want you to say this with me. I want you to look at your neighbor and say this. You, let's try it one more time. You were made for this. Say it one more time. You were made for this. When I left... Uh, the Chicago area and came to Southern Illinois, I enrolled in high school in Vienna. And when I enrolled in high school, I had someone, or I had several someones approach me about the rodeo club. And they wanted me to join. And they said, man, we want you to join. You were made for bulldogging. Well, being out of the city, I, I didn't have a clue what bulldogging was. I, I, I thought, you know, this was a rodeo. I didn't know they had any dogs there. <clears throat> but they said, you, 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 you would be perfect for bulldogging. You, you're, you're build, you, you were made for this. There was only one problem with that. When I discovered what bulldogging was, here was a problem. Me jumping off a perfectly good horse on a cow with horns sticking out of its head. Somehow I couldn't figure out how I was made for this. And so sometimes we have people that look us, they, they view us, and, and they see things in us maybe that we don't see in ourselves, or, or, or they, they look at things and they think about, man, they, they, they're just made for that. They're, they're just made for it. And so I thought about how, you know, when it comes time to, you know, we, we're, we're choosing, you know, teams, ba basketball. Linda, would you come up here just a second? That's all right. Just take your time. Come on up here, would you? Cat, would you come up here? <laughs> Going to play a little bit of basketball. Let me get uh, Deborah. Come on up here, would you? Kylie, would you come up here just a second? We want to make sure these teams are even. Kylie's on my Come on up and uh, Nancy, can I borrow you just a second? <laughs> and Ashley, Ashley, would you come up now? We want to make sure it's fair. So it's 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 three on three. And there's no men playing, it's just all women, okay? So, oh, jump one. ball, you ready? Who's gonna <laughs> jump for you? <laughs> now, we, we, we laugh at this and we, we're, we're looking, everybody's laughing, they're going, well, wait a minute, it's, it looks like these girls were made for this. And then, well, somebody's excited about it. And, 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 and then, and, and did you hear what Deborah said? Said, we might have been back in the day. You know, because we're, we're, you know, and, and, and it's just like, you know, so, then, and, and, and man, I'm made for this and, and let's go and let's, let's do it. And, and then you look and you're thinking and we make judgment calls according to what we see on the outside, but not necessarily what's on the inside. Because I've seen some tall folk that couldn't play ball very well. Now, not these girls, I've watched them play and they, they, they're the real deal. They got it going on, but what I'm saying is this, do you know that the average man in America, quit looking down at me, <laughs> stand down there, the average man, <laughs> the average man in America is five foot nine point three inches tall. 
and 99% of the men in America are 6'4 or under. 99% of men in America are 6'4 or under. And yet the average height of a guy that plays in the NBA is 6'7. So what's up with that? Saying, well, we're made for this. But what I want you to understand is there was an NBA player by the name of Muggsy. Muggsy Bogues. See, I was just waiting to see if you knew what the name was. He played for four different NBA teams over a span of 14 years his career spanned 14 seasons and he was five foot three inches tall he was made for this give them a hand would you thank you girls here you go <laughs> oh here i'll take it up here i might just because <laughs> careful don't get me war don't get me started <laughs> hang on hang on just Well, don't tell me I can't, don't know how to play a guitar. <laughs> Just because it doesn't look like it on the inside doesn't mean you don't have it. I mean, just because it doesn't look like it on the outside doesn't mean you don't have it on the inside. You see, there's one thing that we forget about, and that's something called heart. If you've got a heart to do something... And if you've got a heart to do something, your heart capacity so supersedes your stature. If you have a heart to do it. Muggsy, five foot three, dancing around guys over seven foot tall, had a career of 14 years. At five foot three. I watched some clips of him. I started to bring some of here out, but I figured you'd get more interested in that. And so I, I just wanted you to understand that it's not always about what you look like or even about necessarily how you feel. Because how many of you have ever met somebody that can make you feel different about yourself? And that, my friend, is huge. You know, I've never been an artist. I conned my art teacher into doing my project in high school. She said, I need to demonstrate. I said, here, demonstrate on mine. I'm willing to sacrifice my clay. I was going to do something like Michelangelo did with David, but I'll, I'll, I'll pass and let you... Do it now. My wife, on the other hand, she can take play doh. She took, I bought the kids play doh. I wish I'd have brought your, you don't happen to have that head around here, do you? I, I, I bought the kids some play doh for Christmas one year. I came in, and Debbie is playing with her play doh. It started out with she and Shaylee. She said, Nana, let's, let's play with Play-Doh. And, and Debbie said, okay. And they sat down. Well, long after Shaylee had lost interest, I'm talking about long after, like two or three weeks after. How many? A hundred, over a hundred hours after Shaylee had lost interest. I've lost my wife to another man at our kitchen table that looks like Abraham Lincoln. She's fashioning, and, and honestly, I'm, I, I, I'm looking at that, and I'm thinking, how in the world do you do that? And I had, I had given up any hopes I had of ever being an artist until. Maybe there's a happy tree, evergreen tree. He lives right there. Start with just touching the canvas. Use just the corner of the brush, just the corner, and begin pushing, making the bristles bend slightly downward. See there? Look at that. Isn't that a nice little tree? And he lives right here in this brush. All you have to do is sort of push him out. Each time you start a new evergreen, reload the brush to a nice sharp chisel edge. Go through the same procedure. Let's have another one. Maybe he lives soup right there. Just make a decision and drop him in. 
wherever you want him. There he goes. There he goes. One of the questions I get asked quite frequently, what if I do a tree and decide I don't like him? Or maybe I'll make him taller. Watch here, watch here. Let's say, well, I hate to mess up his tree, but I want to show you this. It's a good tree. Maybe you want to make his tree taller. All you have to do is touch and come right back over the top of him. See here? And you just paint a bigger tree right over the top. We don't make mistakes. We have happy accidents. And you have a brand new, beautiful tree that easy. Did you hear that? We don't make mistakes. We just have happy accidents. But in our mind, sometimes all we see ourselves as is one big mistake. Sometimes we view ourselves through the eyes of someone else instead of through the eyes of God. And we need to understand this one thing. We, we've got to understand that we all have something in common. Deborah, Linda, just look. You don't even have to stand up. Just look over toward Kat. And I want you to say this with me. I got something in common with you. Yeah, we, now, now here, here's a stretch for you. Dean, look at Linda and say, I've got something in common with you. Uh, take a, hey, Jason, is Jason here? Jason, stand up. See how puny he is? <laughs> I got something in common with you. What are you talking about? You don't even look. We all have something in common. There is one thing that we were all truly made for. Turn around, look at your neighbor one more time and say, you were made for this. I want you to go to Genesis 1, verses 27 and 28. You were made for this. So God created man in his own image. Everybody say his image. In the image of God created he him male and Thank you. Male and female created he them, and God blessed them, and God said unto them, be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea. Everybody say, over the fish, over the fowl of the air. Everybody say, over the fowl. And over every living thing, everybody say, all the wildlife that moveth upon the earth. And so, what we need to remember is this. So, this is what I want you to notice, that God creates us all. He creates man and woman. And he gives us a mandate to both men and women. Not to just the men alone, but to men and women. He created them and he said to them be fruitful multiply replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over wildlife now this is what i want you to understand that everything that happens in a natural world has a spiritual correlation so when god speaks to us about when when god speaks to us about multiplying or about being fruitful he's not just talking to us about our offspring filling the earth there's a spiritual implication to it everybody say be fruitful now this is important you get this because this is what you were made for he says be fruitful now look what jesus tells us in john 15 and 2 Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Obviously, Jesus isn't saying everyone that's in him that doesn't have kids, he gets rid of. What's he saying, or what he's saying is this, is that I want every life that comes to me, I intend for that life to be fruitful. And if that life isn't fruitful, then I'm going to remove that life because 
an unfruitful life is an unproductive life. Now stay with me here. He also makes a statement and said, and if you are fruitful, I'm going to prune you. Everybody go, ouch. How many of you have trees at your house? Are they happy trees? Bob Ross only makes happy trees. You know, when trees get unhappy, it's when they're not pruned. When all of a sudden they're let go and then they just start to get all mangled and they bust and they break and then they, they, they don't look nice and uniform anymore because nobody's pruning them. Why are you pruning them? Because they're being fruitful, because they're growing. And if you want it to continue to grow healthy, if you prune it. Everybody say prune it. He wants our life in him to produce. Adam and Eve are removed from the Garden of Eden for disobedience. Because a life of disobedience is unfruitful. Man, it's quiet in here. A life of disobedience is unfruitful. How many of you, I know that Kathy Williams taught, Lloyd taught, Gwen taught. How many other teachers are there in here that have ever taught? Did you ever have a student that just refused to listen? Did you ever have a student in the classroom that was always disruptive and that would not listen? I taught Sunday school class in the hood. <laughs> No, it, was, it felt like the hood. I, I taught Sunday school class, so we had kids come into the class. Man, they, they told me these kids kicking each other under the tables, you know, climbing on top of... They, they, this, this one boy in particular would climb up on top of his mom's car and cuss her out. And he was in my class. And he tried that with me. And it didn't work. Why? Because you can't allow. Here's what, what God said. Jesus is saying that if it's unfruitful, if it's not producing, I'm going to break it off and get it away from the tree. Why? Because if you don't, it will kill the rest of the tree. It will adversely affect the rest of the tree. That's why we need to be fruitful. Turn around, look at your neighbor and say, I was made for this. I was made to be fruitful. I was made for my life to have an impact. I don't care what you think about yourself. I don't care what your perception is. And I don't care what Uncle Mary said about you or Aunt Jane. I know I said Uncle Mary. <laughs> Can't never tell. <laughs> So what, what I am saying to you is this, is that the only voice that ought to really matter in your life is the voice of God. And God said, you're more than a conqueror. God said, you can do exceeding and abundantly. Amen. So everybody say, I'm fruitful. He told us to be fruitful. The next thing he said to us is to multiply. How many of you love multiplication? Oh, man, if, if you knew anything about the banking industry, you'd get excited. Because I love compound interest. I can see none of us are getting any of it. <laughs> but it multiplies. When you multiply, it increases quicker and it increases faster. Now, let's take a look at the term multiply that's used in Scripture. Because the term multiply in the Old Testament means not only to increase, but it means to be in authority. He said, I want you to multi I want you to be in authority. Look it up. That's the Hebrew definition of it. Be in authority. What was God saying? God was saying, I want you to walk in authority on this earth. I, listen to what Jesus says in Matthew. You remember this story? This is in Matthew, the eighth chapter. But the officer said, Lord, I'm not worthy to have you come into my home. Just say the word from where you are, and my servant will be healed. 
I know this because I'm under the authority of my superior officers and I have authority over my soldiers. I only need to say go and they go or come and they come. And if I say to my slaves, do this, they do it. Jesus heard that and the Bible said Jesus marveled or this translation said he was amazed. Why? Because this guy understood authority like nobody else did. Here is a guy that is not a Jew. He's a Gentile. He's a Roman officer. They can't stand Rome, but this guy loves God. And here's a man that understands more authority than those that were called to it. Do you understand that God always intended for us to walk in authority? to speak in authority, uh, to be in authority. Never to abuse it. Never to misuse it. But to understand what it means to have it. And Jesus saw it and was amazed. And he said, I've not seen this kind of faith in all of Israel. He wants us to multiply. Everybody say multiply. Walk in authority authority. God intended us for us to walk in the authority he gave us and to replenish the earth. The word replenish means to fill. Everyone say to fill. Now I want you to get this. He wants us to fill the earth with his glory. Amen. You're supposed to produce Walk in authority and fill the earth with his glory. Amen. Isaiah said, in the year that King Uzziah died, let me say it to you this year, or this way. In the year that the authority of flesh died, I saw him seated on the throne high and lifted up. Because until you learn to say no to yourself and yes to him, you're never going to see him high and lifted up. Until you get to the place that you want less of you and more of him, you're not going to get it. And Isaiah said, in the year that Uzziah died, he was related to Uzziah. He was related to the king. He had learned how to lean on the arm of the flesh, but now he had to lean on the arm of God. And he said, I saw his train fill the temple. He said, and I saw seraphims. And these seraphims were crying out to each other, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. The earth is full of his glory. Everybody say it with me. The earth is filled with his glory. He's going to get glory And when we don't do it, something else will. That's what Jesus said. They came to Jesus when the people, he was coming into Jerusalem and they were going out and crying, Hosanna, blessed seed that comes in the name of the Lord. And they were trying to get Jesus to shut it down. And Jesus looked at him and said, if these hold their peace, the rocks will cry out. Because I'm going to be glorified. And you were made to fill the earth with his glory. Everybody say, you were made for this. The last thing, or the next thing he talked about, and I'm going to do this a little backward because next comes subdue and then dominion, but I want to look at dominion. Because when he speaks about dominion, he speaks explicitly about over the fish, the birds, the animals, wildlife. So what's he saying? He's saying, You're t- you are to, I've given you a job to do. I created this earth. I created you and I've given you a job to do as the star of my creation I want you to control and manage the wildlife. Now, I I don't know if there's anybody in here that's against hunting, but let me explain something to you. Hunting manages wildlife. 
Because if you do away with hunting, then what happens is you have a deer population that explodes and the deers become sickly and diseased and their growth is stunted because now you've got so many deer contending for the same food source. That's why there is wildlife management and it helps to control it, to manage it so it's healthy. Everybody say, keep it healthy. Now, some of us, the only wildlife we know about is our Friday nights. And God is saying, control it. Get it under control. Because if it's not under control, it'll control you. How many of you know that we harvest trees? And when we harvest trees, we replant them, right? Amen. Why? Because we're managing our forests. Now think about this. This is God's instruction to us. And this is what happens. That if you don't, they manage forests with what they call controlled burns. And if you don't have a controlled burn, you'll end up with a burn out of control. So there are things in our lives that we go through that the scripture says it this way. It's like that we're, we're tried in the fire. There's something that's being burned out of us. So we can deal with it in the right measurement because if it's just let go, then at some point in our life, we're going to be out of control. Everybody say, I need, I got control. No, 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 don't say that. <laughs> I got excited. I started to say, everybody say, I got control issues. <laughs> what I want you to say is this. I want you to say, keep it in control. He says, dominion, keep it in, manage it, keep it in control. Now, the next thing he speaks about is to subdue. When it came to the earth, he instructs us to subdue the earth. Everybody say, subdue it. Look at, look at Psalms 115 and 16. It says, the heaven, even the heavens are the Lord's, but the earth he has given to the children of men. And what did he tell us to do with it? He told us to subdue it. The word subdue means subjugate it means to bring under power or dominion to conquer by force and compel to submit to the government or absolute control of another wow why would he say this about the earth why would he create us and then tell us that we were to subdue the earth. And he uses this term about to conquer, to subjugate it, to bring it under control, to dominate it. It's because of who was dominating it when we got here. You remember Jesus speaks to his disciples in a place in Matthew. You can go ahead and throw that scripture up in a place in, in the gospel. And he, he's talking to his disciples and he said, I beheld Satan fall like lightning being cast out of heaven so think about this that we we understand what happened the devil tries to usurp god's authority he tries to make himself put himself over god and in an instant god takes him and at the speed of 186,000 miles per second casts him out of heaven to the earth and he dominated the earth you say oh come on have you got scripture for that i'm glad you ask in matthew 4 8 and 9 when jesus has fasted for 40 days and 40 nights then the devil appears before him. You, you know what happens. He tell, at, tries to get him to get, turn stones into bread. And, and he tries to take him to, you know, throw himself off of a pinnacle. But the last thing he does is he takes him to the highest spot on a mountain. And he shows him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And listen to what he says. He says, I'll give you all these if you'll bow down and worship me. You can't give what isn't yours. You cannot give what isn't yours. 
God had cast the devil out of heaven into earth and the devil was dominating earth. In John 14 and 30, Jesus is speaking to his disciples. Again, this is right before he goes to Calvary and he says, I will no longer talk much with you. Watch his words. For the ruler of this world is coming and he hath nothing in me. Jesus plainly stated that the ruler of this world was coming. He was talking about Satan was getting ready to make an inroad and try and defeat his purpose. Everybody say, I was made for this. Jesus makes a statement. He said, he said, for this purpose, I came into the earth. We didn't come in for the purpose of dying. We came into the earth for the purpose of glorifying. We came into the earth for the purpose of being fruitful and multiplying and showing God's glory on display. Well, how does that happen? Think about it. Satan is cast out of heaven. He becomes the ruler of this earth. Now, we all know that God could take Satan out like that. But instead, what God chooses to do is the ultimate in his ability. He says, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to take something I create with my hand that I love. I'm going to breathe into it and delegate authority to it. And man is going to defeat you. Man is, oh, you're not hearing what I, man is going to defeat you. Man is going to fill the earth with my glory. And when you fill the earth with the glory of God, it drives the devil out. Because it is, darkness is expelled. It drives it out. You say, well, can you prove that? I'm glad you ask. When Jesus is contending with the devil during this temptation period, when he's in the wilderness, you remember what he said? He said, if you're the son of God, do what? Command that these stones be made bread. And what did Jesus reply? No sweat. No, Jesus said, man. <laughs> we read that and we miss what he did. Jesus said, I know you're trying to get me to tap into my divine nature. And if I did that, what hope would they have? So what I'm going to do is I have come as a man to show all men that you can be defeated. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And because he wrought victory over him, we can have victory through him. We are to subdue. How do we accomplish it? Through our relationship with him. As we grow in relationship with God, we fill the earth with more and more of his glory. Paul said it this way. He said, we're being changed. How? He said, we're being changed from glory to glory. What's Paul saying? Paul's saying, wherever increasing we're ever multiplying we are ever being more and more fruitful and with every glory that we transform to it fills the earth and it begins to bring God's domain into the kingdom that he gave for us to stand in everybody's trying to get out of here and God's saying I want you to take authority here Walk with a kingdom mindset. Walk with it in your heart and in your mind. I'm not trying to escape something. I'm going to conquer it. Now listen, it's in man to conquer. Everybody say it. It's in man to conquer. What man doesn't like a good John Wayne movie? What man hasn't dreamed of himself saying, go ahead? make my day <laughs> it's wired in us to conquer now stay with me here <clears throat> because what the devil does is he tries to confuse us 
So what happens with this subdue is oftentimes men get their wires crossed because being able to, to subdue has everything to do with relationship. I can't subdue if I'm not in good relationship with God. I cannot conquer if I'm not in good relationship with God. But the devil crosses the wires up and that nature to conquer, he tries to suggest to you that that ought to happen between a man and a woman. And so now a woman is no longer a wife to be loved, but territory to be conquered. Turn around, look at your neighbor and say, I wasn't made for that. That's not who I am. I'm a child of God. Amen. I'm a child of the King. Amen. I do not subdue my, I don't subdue my brothers and sisters. I was commissioned to subdue the earth, to wrestle from Satan the power that he had, his control, and bring it back into the domain that God always intended it to be in. Everybody say, that's what I'm made for. I want you to see, I, I, I talked about this twisting, this, this deceiving in Genesis, you see it happen between the serpent and Eve. And Eve tells the serpent that we can eat from every fruit of the tree of the garden. Except the tree of knowledge of good and evil, because in the day that we eat of that, we'll die. And Satan suggested something to her. He said, you won't die. You won't die. But in the day you eat that fruit, let me tell you why God doesn't want you to eat that fruit. Because in the day you eat it, you're going to be like God. So the devil accuses God, goes to Eve and accuses God of trying to protect himself from humanity by keeping people from becoming like him. He said, the day you eat of that fruit, you'll die. He, he suggests to Eve that God's trying to keep you away from it because he knows that you're going to be like him. Now check this out because what happens is Adam and Eve tried to obtain through an act of disobedience what they already had by design. She ate the fruit of the tree because Satan said, you'll be like God. And she didn't recognize she was already like God. She had been made in his likeness, created in his image. Do you understand that that hasn't stopped that the devil continues to try and wrestle away the authority God gave us by confusing us and causing us to question who we were made to be. Amen. Turn around and look at your neighbor and say, I was made by the hand of God. It is he that has made us and not we ourselves. Satan didn't come into the Garden of Eden and try and take possession of Adam and Eve by force. He couldn't. So what he does is he simply suggests something to them. And when we surrender our authority, we come into agreement. Let me say it this way. We come into agreement when we come into agreement with his suggestions, we surrender the authority God gave us. Let me say it one more time. When we come into agreement with the devil's suggestions, then we lose the authority that God gave us. 
Listen to what Paul wrote in Romans 6 and 16. Don't you realize that you become the slave of whatever you choose to obey? You can be a slave to sin, which leads you to death, or you can choose to obey God, which leads to righteous living. Now check this out. Because if you're not careful, you read that and your mindset is, I'm a slave, which means I'm being controlled, I'm being forced. No, you're not being forced. You surrendered your right because you agreed with what he was saying. You need to be careful what you come to an agreement with. You need to be careful what you're speaking out of your mouth. You ought to never say something about yourself that God hasn't said about you. Never allow the devil to cause you to begin to confess something that God did not confess about you. Amen. That's why Jesus rebuked Peter when he suggested that he'd never be crucified. He recognized where the suggestion was coming from. And what did he say to Peter? He said, Get behind me, Satan. What's he doing? Do, don't you know that we, we know because we've read the book. Jesus was already wrestling with surrendering his will, with obeying the will of God. He was already wrestling with that because he, we know that because in the garden he prays, not my will, but your will be done. What did he say? He said, if there's any way, take this away from me. The devil can't read our mind but he can put thoughts in it and so what he's doing is he's taking a calculated risk man can't live by bread alone what man would ever want to die he takes a calculated risk and he does it through the inner circle, through someone that's close to him. And he runs up and it all sounds good and it looks good on the outside. But just like these basketball teams, it's not always about appearance. It's whether or not you've got a heart to take the court and get the ball in the basket. That's why Michael Jordan's coach cut him from varsity. He didn't let him play varsity. He made him stay in junior varsity. Why? He said, because if I put him in varsity, I knew he'd be on the bench most of the time. He was a young player. But if I left him in junior varsity for a year, then when he came to varsity, he wouldn't just be playing. He'd be leading the team. Don't you understand that God isn't trying to hold something back from us? He's trying to get something to us. So a delay is not a denial. He doesn't stop it. He just delays it so you can be in control when you get Get there. Authority. I apologize. I wasn't going to get excited. I'm not apologizing. I am excited. Amen. He's trying to get something to us. And so he recognized, you've got to recognize where it's coming from. Look, even people close to you. Let me ask you a question. How many of you have ever been used by the devil? <laughs> say, oh, oh, thank God some hands went up. I started to say nobody's going to raise their hand, but guess what? You, if, you've, if you've lived longer than five years old, you've been used. Amen. What, what five-year-old child at some point or another hasn't gone into a Walmart and tested their mother's patience? That doesn't mean you turn around and look at that child and say, I rebuke you, Satan. <laughs> it means you learn how to walk in the authority that God's given you. No, now I told you, you can't have that. So that, that's enough, okay. But what happens is we let it take it to the limits. Now you understand how powerful an attack this was for Jesus to have responded the way that he did. I contend for you that he's already thinking about it. Oh, I can't believe you said that. Why not? He said it in the garden. He said, if there's any way, let this cup pass. He's already thinking, man, if there's a way out of this, I want it. And about the time he's thinking that, Peter steps up. And says, Lord, this is never going to happen to you. Be it far from you. This is never going to happen to you. And he said, get behind me, Satan. 
this is just a trap trying to rob me of what I was made for. And I'm not going to let that happen. Turn around, look at your neighbor and say, I'm not going to let it happen. Listen to what Jesus tells us then. Now in John, the 12th chapter, Jesus tells us, now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. What do you say? The prince of this world is what? Cast out. What's he saying? What Adam and, what Adam and Eve lost in the fall, I'm getting ready to give back to you. <laughs> What Adam and Eve surrendered in the garden, I'm going to claim at Calvary's cross. What was lost to you through disobedience is going to be restored through obedience. And he was obedient, even obedient to the death on the cross. Yet the prince of this world is getting ready to be cast out. So don't surrender what Christ died for. In Luke, the 10th chapter, when the 72 disciples returned, they joyfully reported to him, Lord, even demons obey us when we use your name. And Jesus said, look, I've given you authority over all the power of the enemy, and you can walk among snakes and scorpions and crush them. Nothing will injure you. But don't rejoice because evil spirits obey you. Rejoice because your names are registered in heaven or your names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Amen. What's he saying? He said, it's no big deal for the devil to be subject to you. That's what you're made for. Don't run around saying, you know, I mean, well, you know, well, no, I better not use that analogy. Sometimes I have these things pop in my head. Don't, don't, don't run around I'm a Christian. <laughs> I'm a Christian. I'm, I'm a child of God. I, I float on butterflies' wings. No, no. You float like a butterfly and sting like a bee. <laughs> You've you got to remember what you're made for. You're made for authority. You're made to dominate. You're made to take control, but you only get it through a relationship with him. Amen. And without that... You lose it all. Everybody say, I want that. <laughs> Satan cannot take it from you. You have to surrender it. Don't do it. Don't, don't surrender that. The devil tries to bombard our thoughts with his suggestions. You're never going to be good enough. or God doesn't love you. Or, You're never going to measure up. Don't believe him. He's the father of liars. Why would you believe the father of liars? Don't buy into that. Listen to what Paul tells the eighth chapter. So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. Therefore, dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. What shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean, now get this, does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or endangered or threatened with death? No. Turn around, look at your neighbor and say no. It does, but that's what we think it means. Why? Because we're letting him suggest that to us. Amen. The Bible said it rains on the just and the unjust. You're not going to have every day on a mountaintop. But when you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you don't have to fear any evil. Amen. He says, no, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. Stand on the authority of his word. Be fruitful, multiply, take dominion, subdue the earth, and reflect the likeness you were created in by filling the earth with his glory. Would you stand with me? Look at your neighbor one more time and say, I was made for this. 
I was made to fill the earth with his glory. You know, everybody doesn't appreciate my singing. <laughs> but that's okay. Because I'm not singing to them. I'm singing to him. Amen. Now that doesn't mean that I ought to run up here and jump and get a microphone. <laughs> I won't be on the praise team. Woo! <laughs> That's not my gift. But I was made to fill the earth with his glory. And can I tell you that I've been, I, there have been times that I've traveled going down the road and I sang for everything I was worth. And heavens were rejoicing. I mean heavens. Angels were rejoicing in heaven. Because how many of you know that God is able to interpret tongues? <laughs> and so even though my singing may have sounded like something that was unintelligible to some, he knew exactly what I was saying. I'll go you one better. There have been sometimes I've raised my hands and not one word has come out of my mouth, but I've filled the earth with his glory because I was magnifying him in my heart. Fill the earth. Take them. Do you really believe that's how it works? Ask Jehoshaphat. He's got a kingdom that's coming against him that's threatening to annihilate him. And God told him to stand still and, or God, God told him that, you know, just, just take it easy. He said, I, I'm going to fight this battle. And then he orders the battle, Jehoshaphat orders all the worshipers to go out first. Not the soldiers, not special forces, but the worshipers. And they went out worshiping God, praising him and filling the earth with his glory. And as they went forward filling the earth with his glory, when they showed up at the battlefield, the enemy was already dead. You drive the devil out by filling yourself up with his praise. You take authority when you worship God. Everybody say, that's what I was made for. Romans 16 and 20. It says, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. Don't you think it's time we come into agreement with that? Amen. Raise our feet and begin to praise his name. So this is what I want you to do with your feet today. I want you to allow your feet to bring you to the front of this building together because we all have this in common. We were all made for this. We hope you've been touched by today's message. I wanted to take a moment and just remind you how very much God loves you. The Apostle Peter tells us that it's not his will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. In the book of Jeremiah, the 29th chapter, God speaks through the prophet and tells us that I know what my plans are for you, that they're plans for good and not for destruction, to give you a future and a hope. That's what God wants for your life. He has a plan and a purpose designed specifically for you. And you can walk into that plan and purpose by just asking him in your heart today. I wonder if you'd take a moment right now and just stop wherever you're at and pray this prayer with me. God, I ask you to forgive me of all of my sin. Lord, I believe that Jesus was crucified on my behalf that you raised him from the dead so that I could have life. And right now, I accept you as my Lord and Savior in Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer and you meant it from your heart, we believe that angels are rejoicing in heaven because you've come home. Now the important thing is for you to find a good Bible-believing church and become a part of that as you continue your journey with Jesus. We want to invite you to come and be with us any chance you get. Until then, remember, Jesus loves you, and we do too.